Okay, so yesterday ended by stating this set of additive generators for the tautological ring. So I'll state that again and say a bit more about it. This I think the set of generators was sort of common knowledge at the time, but Graeber and Ponda, Ponda were the ones who first um, actually wrote down the details proving this is proving this theorem. So theorem is that R star M G N bar tautological ring is additively generated. by classes iota gamma star of right, a psi kappa monomial. So remember that iota gamma is the gluing map associated to a dual graph gamma. So it's like a like the basic gluing maps originally wrote down by gluing over multiple pairs of points at the same time. Then I'm pushing forward along that map some monomial and the psi and kappa classes. So, example of what, how, how do we think about such a class? Well, we first write, draw the graph gamma, so it has some vertices connected in some way. Maybe we have a loop. Um, this graph gamma, remember, it has vertices, has edges, also has legs, half edges corresponding to the n marked points. Example, one there, two there, three there. And finally, each vertex, we have to remember what genus that vertex is. This is g equals one, this is g equals zero, g equals zero as well. Then the way to interpret this picture is each vertex is a smaller MGI-NI bar. The genus is annotated directly on the graph and the number of marked points is the um, valence of the vertex, the number of half edges out of it counting legs. So the corresponding iota gamma here, example, it should be from a product of three MGI NI bars corresponding to three vertices. We have like an M03 bar from the top vertex. We have an M12 bar from the left vertex. And we have M06 bar from the right vertex. And it's a gluing map where I have to glue together many pairs of points here. So what's happening here is that these three marked points correspond to these three half edges out of this vertex. And for each edge, edge has two half edges and you glue together the corresponding points. In this case, you're going to end up with only three marked points left at the end which haven't been paired off. And the genus, you have to think about what the arithmetic genus is of, of, of a resulting curve, and it's going to be zero plus zero plus one plus you have two additional cycles. So the sense of being a map to M33 bar. Sorry, what was it? You ask about ordering the half edges? Yeah, implicitly one, implicitly I'm doing that. I mean, that, that's just a matter of automorphisms of the, um, of the, of this product of M's given by permuting some of the indices here. So for instance, the image isn't going to matter. But yeah, there, there are some, if you want to be very careful about precisely what the map is and you have to say of these six points here, one, two, three, four, five, six, label one, two, three, four, five, six in some order there and so on. Okay, so then what one of these classes are, uh, these classes are sometimes called, say these generators 
are called basic classes, basic tautological classes. So to get a basic class here, I also need to choose a, a psi kappa monomial. And by that I mean on M03 bar, you have some psi's and kappas. M12 bar, you have some psi's and kappas. So on, on the product, you can take psi's and kappas from any of these. You take some monomial in all of them and then push forward that monomial. So on the graph gamma, the, the psi classes in these factors here again correspond to half edges in this graph. So if I took, let's say, an M12 bar here, I have classes psi H, psi, uh, say psi H1, psi H2 is what I'll call them. Really psi 1, psi 2. I'm calling psi H1, psi H2 where those are names for these half edges here. Then I have all these kappa classes, which if I wanted to give them names, well, my kappa one at the vertex V. So again, this is a graph. It has vertices, half edges, edges, and so on. Giving some of them names, this vertex is called V. That's H1, that's H2. And then I'm giving names to the kappa classes and psi classes at on M12 bar, bracket V indicating that it's a kappa class in this factor of M rather than one of the other two factors, and so on. So these, this list I've made here, these are the psi and kappa classes in the tautological ring of M12 bar where I've just renamed them using the graph terminology. And then what, what we could end up doing is take, say, iota gamma star of, I don't know, psi, psi h1 times kappa 1 at v, and just not, not put any other decorations at the other things. And then we would interpret this class as this graph here with additional psi and kappa annotations. If we put a single psi along this half edge and put a single kappa one at that vertex. So basic classes, so these generators correspond to stable graphs with vertices and half edges decorated by psi, by kappa and psi classes. Okay. Any questions about this? So these are sort of, these are the basic tautological classes um, and over the course of this week, I'll be talking about a number of formulas which are basically expressing tautological classes in terms of these basic classes, these additive generators. The idea is that if we, as I'll say in a second, we, we have a pretty good understanding of how to manipulate these basic classes, take push forwards, pullbacks, multiply them together, and so on. So we can really effectively do computations in the to, in, inside the tautological ring once we've expressed our classes in terms of these basic classes. Any questions here? One thing I should say, by the way, is what's the cohomological degree of this class? This should be in R something, the RD of MGN bar. What is D here? Well, the cohomological degree certainly get some degree from the psi kappa monomial, the degree of that monomial, where again, psi classes are degree one, kappa, kappa i is of degree i. So d is going to be the degree of the monomial. So then you actually, you have to add something for this push forward. So compute how the push forward changes the cohomological degree. You have to think about what the dimensions are of the two sides here. But the end result that you get, you can check this if you want, is that you have to add the 
number of edges in the graph gamma. Edges meaning full edges. So for instance, this class I wrote down here, I have four edges in this graph, I have degree two thing here, this will be in R6 of M33 bar. All right, so I explained yesterday why these classes are in the tautological ring. In tautological ring because tautological ring is the smallest ring that is closed under push forwards by these gluing maps and these forgetful maps. And size and kappas were defined using those operations. This generalized gluing map is a composition of gluing maps. So if you wanted, you could take this Iota gamma here and factor it as a composition of four gluing maps, one for each of these four edges, four of the basic gluing maps that just glue a single pair of points together. Here we're gluing four pairs of points together. Okay. From this theorem, I mean, in order to prove this theorem, Graeber and Ponder Ponder had to show that the additive span of these basic classes is closed under multiplication and under um, push forward by the basic maps, the gluing and forgetful maps. It's actually a bit more that, that ends up being true. So as another theorem. Is the Thing to say there exist universal combinatorial formulas expressing the their take push forward by gluing or forgetful. Maps, you can take the pullback by the same maps, or you can take the product. Take any of these operations, apply these operations to some number of basic classes, and the result can be expressed by these universal formulas as. Um, linear combinations of basic classes. So you give me a basic class and tell me the give me a forgetful map or a gluing map, I can push forward or pull back that, that class along that map and write it as some of some other basic classes. We've actually already seen examples of that since, for instance, we had the push forward by forgetful map of psi to the power i plus one, kappa i, remember that's how kappa was defined in terms of psi, and that's an example of this formula for push forward but there also exist formulas for pushing forward a kappa class by forgetting about some point or pulling back such a class. And you, you remain inside the linear span of these basic classes. I'm not going to write out these formulas because there are a lot of different cases to think about, but it's a, it's, it's a fun exercise if you haven't done it before um, to think about the intersection theory of, of the situation a bit. You have to do things like use the, use the projection formula and try to compute some of these, like the pullback of a psi class by a forgetful map. Um, the, hard, the most complicated of these formulas by far is take the product of two classes. You might wonder what that would look like since these basic classes, they depend on graphs. Um, it's sort of clear that like if you glue together two basic classes by, if you take the push forward by a gluing map of two basic classes, that should more or less correspond to gluing together the 
associated graphs with their sine kappa decoration. That's basically all that happened. So like push forward by gluing map is very easy formula, but product is more interesting. I'm not going to write out the full formula, but the idea is that if I take iota gamma one star of some monomial alpha one, want to compute the product of that with iota gamma two star of alpha two, what does the product formula look like for these basic classes? And it's going to look like a big sum over graphs gamma three. But I need more to, some conditions on this new graph gamma three. Um, Basically what's going on is that gamma three is going to simultaneously refine both graphs gamma one, gamma two. So formalize this, I want a partition of the edges of gamma three into three disjoint sets, E1, E2, E3. And then I want isomorphisms between, for instance, gamma three, with the edges in the set E2 contracted, I'm gonna use this notation for contraction, that should be isomorphic to gamma one. Similarly, gamma three mod contracting the edges in E1 should be isomorphic to gamma two. So you pick all this data, a graph gamma three, a stable graph gamma three, and um, pick basically two disjoint subsets of the edges, such as if you contract some of the edges, you get one of the graph, contract some of the other edges, you get the other graph. And then the thing that you put in here is then the basic class iota gamma three star, and then I have to tell you what to insert here. And it will essentially be alpha one times alpha two times some self-intersection thing coming from these edges E3. Since edges E3 are sort of the overlap between two graphs. So th this formula is combinatorially quite cumbersome. I mean, you, this, this is a, you start with two graphs, then you can have a lot of different output graphs. So although there exist these universal formulas, they are hard to use directly. In general, multiplying tautological classes, we can do it, but it's, it, it's combinatorially not very nice. And the reason for that is that the new graphs you end up with are sort of combining the two previous graphs in different ways. All right, I, I, there's some other details here that you might want to think about. Like what, when I say contract an edge, what should I do with the genus of the corresponding vertices? Well, if I merge two vertices together, I should add up, I should add their, their genera in the new graph. If I contract a loop, then I should add one to the corresponding genus. Things like that in this formula. Again, I, I, I don't want to get bogged down in the details. The important thing is that there exist these formulas. And this theorem is, and part of this theorem is basically how they proved, is basically the proof of that first theorem. Part of it also has a consequence that tautological rings close in their pullbacks as well as push forwards. They're, it's nicer to define the tautological ring just using push forwards, but the corollary is R star MGN bar. But R, take the set of these for all G and N, R closed, there are pullbacks by gluing or forgetful maps. Okay. Well, that's, that's what I wanted to finish saying about this, this theorem, the set of generators. Again, we, we think of these generators as graphs decorated by Psi and Kappa classes. What did you say? So it's a corollary because this theorem is saying that, um, and saying that there exists some universal formulas, but in particular it's saying that the pullback of a basic class is a linear combination of basic classes. So if the ring is generated by basic classes, then it's closed under pulling back.
Okay, so, so I want to, uh, in a minute I'm going to shift gears a bit and move from MGN bar to MG, the classical case first considered by Mumford. But before I do that, I just want to give an example of what a formula in terms of these basic classes might look like. This is a relatively simple formula for the Turing characters of the Hodge bundle. So first, what's the Hodge bundle? Well, EG, the Hodge bundle is a rank G vector bundle over MG bar. Pull it back to MGN bar if you want. And I'll just say what the fibers look like. So the fiber over a stable curve should be just sections of the dualizing shape. This is a very natural object that shows up a lot when doing, for instance, localization computations involving moduli space of curves. And one of the most basic questions you can ask is, okay, tall logical ring is supposed to contain geometrically natural classes. It should contain the Turing classes of the Hodge bundle then. And so Mumford computed this. Sort of a standard Grundig-Riemann-Roch computation. The turn character of EG in terms of what, what I called these basic classes. Turn character it should start with G because it's a rank G bundle. Sum over L greater than or equal to one. Have some coefficient here, which is Bernoulli number B2L divided by 2L factorial. Multiplied by Okay, so first we could have just have a kappa class. So here's now maybe some place where I should say that, okay, my basic classes all had iota gamma lower star, but if you take a special case of gamma with no edges, just a vertex and n legs off of it, gamma is a vertex, genus G, legs one, two, three through n, then, well, what's iota gamma? So this is the dual graph of a smooth curve. Then iota gamma is just the identity map from mg n bar to itself. So that's the sense in which kappa 2L minus one is a basic class with dual graph precisely this, and an annotation of a kappa on the, on the single vertex. Okay, but then there are going to be more terms. The remaining terms I'm going to write as a sum over gamma, a stable graph with really, I mean, a stable graph for MGN bar with exactly one edge. So these graphs correspond to boundary divisors in moduli space of curves. And what I want to take then, take one over the cardinality of the automorphism group of gamma. This automorphism, think about it a bit, it's either one or two. In this case. Two if you have a loop or if you break the curve into two pieces of, of equal general, no marked points on either side, and it's one otherwise factor, and then I take iota gamma lower star. So 
In this case, there, there are two, two cases for what does gamma look like. It either looks like you have a single edge like this with general G1, G2, or you have a loop, G minus one there. These are the two possibilities for gamma. In either case, you have two psi classes that you can take, because again, psi classes correspond to half edges. You have exactly two half edges here. And your possible location. So in terms of psi classes, I have two psi classes to work with, and I'm going to take psi to the power 2L minus one plus psi prime to the power 2L minus one divided by psi plus psi prime. That's the formula here. So this is a relatively simple formula as formulas in MGN bar go. So if you look at what's happening here, the only graphs that show up are you have the graph with no edges and all the graphs with one edge. Just the graphs that appear are precisely the ones with less than or equal to one edge and then you're taking some very specific kappa or psi classes and pushing forward. So does the churn character of this Hodge bundle. Now, this churn character rather than like the total churn class, if I wanted to get the individual turn, churn classes of the Hodge bundle, usually called the lambda classes, then I would need to take this formula and um, basically take, take certain polynomials in the individual terms here. And I mean, one can do this, the result will be tautological, but it will be much more complicated to write down the actual total churn class of the Hodge bundle using this formula, because I'll need to use this product formula to multiply together a bunch of these. So if I tried to write down a formula for the total churn class rather than churn character of EG, I would need to use basically arbitrary basic classes. Because in this product, um, everything is going to show up. Okay, so this is just, just an example of what formulas in tautological writing in terms of basic classes tend to look like. You have some sum over graphs, in this case, sum over very specific graphs with at most one edge. Where some psi's and kappa's in. Okay, I'm going to shift now to MG. So as I said at the end um, yesterday, we can define tautological ring of any intermediate moduli space M contained in MGN bar just as the restriction N bar restricted to M or M contained MGN bar. I mean, this definition might not make sense for some, or, uh, I'm saying this for like arbitrary subvarieties, but substacks, but in the case of MG, this, this coincides with the classical definition. So what does this mean for R star of MG? And so the point is we still have the same additive basis, we just have to restrict things. Then is additively generated by, I'll just write it down, we take iota gamma lower star of some kappa psi monomial, trick to mg from mg bar. But the point is this is going to be zero unless gamma is the dual graph do smooth curve. If gamma is any edges, this is just zero because by definition this push forward is supported on, um, on the singular curves. So when we restrict mg, it just vanishes. Yeah, so, so see that here. But these classes vanish if number of edges of gamma is greater than zero. <coughs> but that's precisely what restricting to smooth curves does. 
So the result is that r star of mj is, uh, I should also note that we don't have any marked points here, so we just have kappa classes. So r star of mg is just polynomials in kappa one, kappa two, and so on. If we were taking mgn, smooth curves genus g with n distinct marked points, tall logical ring there would be polynomials in the kappa classes along with n psi classes. So really we're throwing away most of the complication. The complication of MGN bar comes from these boundary strata, these complicated dual graphs. Sorry? I mean, at the moment I haven't, I haven't said, but um, I mean, a priori you can say that kappa 3G minus two has to vanish because you're in dimension 3G minus three. They actually vanish starting at, kappa g minus one. You don't need them after about kappa g over three. But at the moment, just using the general theorem about these additive generators for the tall logical ring from gn bar and restricting that, we get that it's polynomials in kappa one, kappa two, and so on. So state that, take polynomials, kappa one, kappa two, one variable in each degree, formal polynomials there, this rejects onto R star of MJ. It's a much simpler case here. We're just interested in some, some ring generated by one element in each degree, subject to some relations. This is actually how Mumford originally defined the ring, just as the subring of the Chow ring generated by the Kappa classes. One can say is somewhat arbitrary. Why are we choosing the kappa classes rather than say the churn, the churn classes of the Hodge bundle, the lambda classes? And by going about things in this way, starting with MGN bar, I hope you get the idea that although the gluing maps and the, the gluing maps and the forgetful maps are not visible in MG, you can't, they don't exist in MG itself. You don't have marked points to forget, you don't have um, you aren't allowed to glue, glue um, curves together because things have to be smooth. But the reason why you're using just the kappa class in the tall logical ring can really be traced to these maps on MGN bar. All right, so. Studying our star of MG is one way of thinking about it is it's a matter of understanding polynomial relations between the kappa classes. We know all the relations and it's just the tall logical ring structure of MG is just the quotient of this polynomial ring by the ideal of relations. So part of Mumford's motivation when originally defining the tall logical ring of MG is something he conjectured known as Mumford's conjecture later proven by Madsen Weiss, which says that these Kappas in some stable limit of the cohomology, they freely generate the, the stable cohomology. So to state that precisely, Mumford's conjecture theorem of Madsen Weiss. So it states that state it precisely again for any v greater than zero, the map that I wrote there from this formal polynomial ring in the kappas.
homology of mg so not just the topological ring, but to the cohomology. This map is an isomorphism in degree d for g sufficiently large. Um, if I was a topologist, I would work with mg1 rather than mg. I would talk about um, this actually being a stable limit in the appropriate topological sense, but if I'm just working with MG, this is the, this is the only real way I can cleanly state the conjecture. So this is saying two things. It's saying both that if you let the genus be much larger than the cohomological degree, then all your classes are tautological in that, that degree, they're all polynomials in the kappa classes, also says that for G large compared with D, um, there are no relations between the kappa classes. Informal thing that you can say is limit G goes to infinity star of MG equals polynomials in the kappa classes. Okay, so this, this was the original motivation for the Kappa classes month free conjecturing this, that they, um, although the tautological ring for specific G is not, it's not the full cohomology by any stretch, it's not even close, but. Um, I, I forget exactly what they proved, it, it was, it's either something like G equals Probably they proved about G equals 3D or something like that. Something linear in D. It depends on whether or not you're using the real degree or the, com or the complex degree. If I'm using complex degree, I think it's G equals 3D or 3D minus one or something like that. Okay. Or, yeah, so there aren't maps between these rings, but if you added in a marked point, worked with MG1, then there would be maps between them. Like, this is actually proven a slightly stronger statement for MG1 is what is what is proven by the topologist. So this is an interesting theorem because the only, the only known proof is topological. All right. So, time remaining, I want to briefly state the sort of next major advance in understanding the structure of MG, which is Faber's conjectures. The tautological ring of MG, it's, it's certainly simpler than the tautological ring of MG and bar. I mean, it's sort of a restriction of it. There's much less going on in MG than MG and bar. We also have less to work with, so. I, somehow the structure of MG is a bit more mysterious what's going on because you just have these classes, you don't have good maps between different MGs, but it is just a matter, studying is a matter of understanding what the kernel is of this map. One is a polynomial and the kappa class is zero in R star of MG. Popper's conjectures, these are from late 90s, I guess. Paul logical ring was defined by Mumford in the 80s. These conjectures give a full description of the ring. So, they'll answer some of the questions before, like when, are, when do the kappa classes vanish? So there can be three parts, four parts, depending on how you count it, there are multiple parts of this conjecture. 
The first part is that Rd of mg equals zero for d greater than g minus two. Vanished at some point, that's why I know that kappa g minus one is zero, and it's Faber also showed that kappa g minus two is non-zero. I'll note, by the way, this is much lower than it has to vanish by dimension, but because we have some open subvariety of MGN bar, you should expect that the cohomology will vanish earlier. It's not the cohomology, this is tautological ring, so it might vanish even sooner than the cohomology. But G minus two is a lot lower than three G minus three. The second part here is I want our G minus two of MG to be one dimensional. Remember, I'm taking rational coefficients everywhere. So, and really, there's like a two A and a two B here. Two B is you have this isomorphism, but moreover, there's an explicit combinatorial formula for that isomorphism. Um, may, may, maybe I'll state that formula in a bit, depending on how much time we have. But actually, given any, any polynomial in the kappa classes of appropriate degree, and see what its image should be under some normalization of this map. It's of course, only defined up to a constant. Part three of the conjecture, maybe I should move up here. Sort of the heart of the matter, which is that take our d of mg cross our g minus two minus d of mg of one tautological class of degree d, one tautological class of degree g minus two minus d, so two polynomials in the kappa classes. I multiply them together, get something Rg minus two of mg, which by the preceding part of the conjecture is one dimensional. This is some bilinear pairing of Q vector spaces, which is a perfect pairing. And of Q vector spaces. Okay, so those are the three parts of the conjectures. And you should think a bit about why do these conjectures fully determine the structure of the ring. So first two parts um, clearly fully determine the structure of the ring in high degree. Intermediate degree, what's going on is just that if you have a polynomial in the kappa classes and you want to know whether or not it vanishes, well, you can compute its pairing against all kappa polynomials of complementary degree. If that pairing is always zero, then because this should be a perfect pairing, that means that you should have started with a relation. That kappa polynomial should vanish. If you ever pair with something non-zero, then you know that it had to be non-zero. So in other words, assuming these conjectures, you have a um, straightforward algorithm for computing whether or not a kappa polynomial is zero. You just compute its pairing with everything else, see if its pairing is ever zero. And this pairing is fully explicit because we can multiply polynomials in the kappa classes and then the isomorphism to the one dimensional space is explicit by this formula I haven't told you. So. Statements. fully determine the structure or star of MG. They're very appealing statements. I mean, you have this uh, 
maybe you could write it that way, but the, I mean, the usual way of writing it is as some sum of products of like double factorials and such. Uh, maybe, maybe, yeah, I have, I have enough time. I'll write that down explicitly. So, this formula is easiest to state. Over here, this is now. In the, natural statement of 2B. So for any, so first I need some notation. For any kappa monomial, kappa A1, kappa A2, kappa AM, I want to let I write curly braces over that monomial. Showing me some polynomial in the kappa classes. Really, this is a change in basis for the kappa polynomials between the standard basis of monomials and some other basis. So here I want to take a sum over permutations in the symmetric group on M elements. For each such permutation, I want to take product over cycles of sigma, cycle decomposition, and then for each cycle, I write down KAC, where kappa AC is equal to, I'll write it as AC is equal to the sum over I in the cycle of A sub I. This is a lot of words, but it's just saying that I sum over all the permutations, view each permutation as a way of grouping together terms and combine the indices in those, those kappa classes. So for instance, sorry, what was that? Yes, if sigma is identity, then you get the original product. An example, you have like kappa A1, um, Curly braces equal to kappa A1. You have two kappas, then you have two terms. One of them is the thing you started with. The other is kappa A1 plus A2, and the next one will have six terms, although some of them will be equal, and so on. Which I guess, yeah, two of them will be equal. So the reason why I want this notation is that then the map in 2B Map to be is so if I take one of these kappa polynomials, you can check that this gives a different basis for kappa polynomials, so I can find things linearly just using this basis. Kappa A1, kappa AM. Should send this, sending this to an element of Q. Sure, I have it right. Two G minus three plus M factorial. Two G minus one double factorial. Double factorial, of course, meaning you multiply together all the odd numbers less odd positive integers less than or equal to two G minus one by minus one factorial product i equals one to m to ai plus one double factorial. So it, it's some combinatorial expression here. And I mean, if you want, you can invert this change of basis and write this fun as a function on monomials as some sum over um, some over like set partitions of things that look like this. But it's fully explicit. You have 2G minus three plus M factorial. 
plus m, m being the number of kappas. Sorry? I mean, I'm always assuming that my moduli spaces are in the stable range of 2g minus 2 plus n um, greater than 0, which means that g should be greater than or equal to 2. For g equals 2, of course, this is not saying that the, the saying tall logical ring is not very interesting because all the kappa classes vanish. g equals 2. Okay, so, that, so that's the actual statement of Fopper's conjectures here. Now, with this explicit formula, you can actually completely effectively, assuming this conjecture, determine whether or not any kappa polynomial you want to track is a relation. So what's the status of this conjecture? So, well, first part is true. Um, Second parts are also true. So I think that I should be attributing these to like Luyunga, Luyunga, and Faber. And then this third part, this explicit combinatorial formula, was actually um, was first proven by Getzer and Pantarapanda by showing that this formula is equivalent to, or mostly equivalent to, the Virasoro constraints um, on the Grolvin theory of P2, which is proven by Givental. So there's a fair amount of work that went into proving, especially 2B, but 1 and 2A also. Um, but the, those, those were established fairly soon. 3 is still open. And I think it's sort of the heart of the matter. I mean, it's good to know that it's all logical ring from G. It becomes one-dimensional at some point. Above that, it vanishes. We have this nice sort of integration formula in that one-dimensional space. But... Part three is what's determining most of the interesting structure of the ring. So what's known about three? Part three. The only part still, no, still open, so it's usually something people just say Popper's conjecture for the third part now. Um, it's, it's also called the Gorenstein conjecture. It's one way of interpreting this is it's saying tall logical rings the Gorenstein ring. Basically, it satisfies this Poincare duality type statement. Um, and this conjecture, it, it, it's saying that the tautological ring of MG looks like the cohomology of a compact manifold of dimension G minus 2. Um, unfortunately, we have no idea what that manifold should be. So, although Clearly, the form of this makes it look like there should be some compact manifold lurking somewhere that this is the actual cohomology of. Um, there, there, there isn't actually any motivation to believe the conjecture based on that, since we have no, we have no clue as to what that, polynom what that manifold could be. But this third part of this Poincare duality, it's Gorenstein conjecture, and it is Faber Checked part three for genus less than 24, and it's true there. But this conjecture is open for all g greater than or equal to 24. So in the couple, yes, yeah, so, so I should say that and this is a very attractive theorem. For a while, I think everybody sort of believed it was true for genus up through 23. I mean, originally checked it like through 13, then 19, then now up to 23. But I, I think at the moment, 
Those people, including Fopper himself, think this is more likely to be false than true. And tomorrow I'll get into to some of the some of the specific reasons why this conjecture is maybe less less believable than it once was, although I mean it's still open. But I should say some words about what's going on with it being tracked up through genus 23, but no, not further. Um, this isn't a matter of Fopper's computer isn't powerful enough to check genus 24. I mean, he got to 23 um, quite a while ago now. But basically, the way Fopper's checking this, he, he had a, a method, very classical method, involving maps between factor bundles of, con of constructing lots and lots of relations between the kappa classes. Just had a machine which produced sort of somewhat random looking relations between the kappa classes. And the way this conjecture works is that if you prove all the, that all the relations it predicts are true are true, then you're done. Since this, this conjecture, one way of interpreting this perfect pairing is it's saying that the maximum possible number of relations are true. Because you can't have any more relations because if something pairs to, to, with something else, something non-zero, then it can't be a relation. So this is really Faber's conjecture saying the maximum possible number of relations are true. So that means if you have some way of proving all those relations are true, then you're done. You know the conjecture is true. You know the tall logical ring is exactly as it's described. And his method of producing relations for genus up through 23, it sort of immediately produced all the relations. Like some specific location, there are 20 relations. He um, ran his program to produce sort of 20 relations. They would be linearly um, independent, and then, then he would get that the conjecture was true. But for genus 24, started, missing, started to miss relations. Um, so it, the way this works is that if you prove lots of relations between the kappa classes, but you're missing one, I mean, you don't know whether or not it's true or not. It's very hard to, given a polynomial in the kappa classes, determine is it zero or not, unless you have something like this conjecture already. And we mainly just have machines for producing lots of relations, not machines for proving something isn't a relation. So from the point of view of Faber's computer calculations, what happened to G24 is that suddenly his method of producing relations isn't good enough to verify the conjecture. It starts getting more and more off as G increases. Yes. Yeah, so it is possible to write down an explicit polynomial in the kappa classes in R12 of M24 such that if this specific polynomial in the kappa classes is zero, then the conjecture is true in genus 24. If it's non-zero, then the conjecture is false. So, let's write that down. Genus 24, there is exactly one missing relation. R12 of M24. All the other degrees are fine, but I believe that the results of Fopper's computer search is Fopper's computations give, I think it's, yeah, that the dimension of R12 10 of M24 is equal to 36, and 36 is less than or equal to dimension of R12 of M24 is less than or equal to 37. And I should say that this one missing relation, of course, it's only well defined up to adding in the other relations that exist. So um, I, you shouldn't expect that if you write it down, it will necessarily look nice. It will just look like some random rational linear combination of all the 
partitions of 12 many monomials in the kappa classes in that degree. Maybe there's some really nice element in that coset of possibilities, but we don't, we don't know of it if there is one. So that's the status of Popper's conjectures. I, I should say for g equals 25, we're again missing exactly one relation, but then for g equals 26, we're missing I think two, and start missing more and more relations, always near the middle of the ring. All right, I should stop here. The plan next time will be to talk about some of the more recent evidence for disbelieving this third conjecture, nice though it is.